Okay, we're up to chapter two. And this is a, a chapter called Family Affairs. Seldom can one put a finger on the precise moment of growing up. We cannot look back and say, before that day or that event or that look in someone's eyes, I was a child, but after that, I was an adult. And yet there are some events which mark a change in the inner status, a shift in relationships with people and conditions in the world around us. My year in Boston marked this transition for me. I was 17 years old and the doctor said I must have a change in climate. Papa sent me to the New England Conservatory of Music. He knew I could not practice long at a time, but he thought I ought to be occupied and he knew that music was my greatest interest. Mama traveled with me as far as Groton, New York. I felt grown up until the time came to say goodbye. And then I did not feel grown up at all. At Groton, I was, I don't know if it's Groton or Groton, but I was joined by my cousin Lil, a talented spirited girl, but she stayed in school only one semester. However, I had a roommate who became a lasting friend. Her name was Hannah Locke. People thought she was plain, but she had quality. Hannah was one of 11 children. Her mother was an invalid, always in bed, so that Hannah had learned responsibility. There was a feeling of responsibility even in her piano playing. We corresponded for many, many years. My piano teacher was a fine looking man who knew he was fine looking. He had a big name, and I hope he will forgive me that I have forgotten it. This next bit shows Harry's understated sense of humor. She is describing in detail how her own Gilderoy Lockhart uh, professor was telling her to hold her hand while playing the piano. In those days, this part did not really need extra explanations. You're you are supposed to hold your hand very much like you do over a computer keyboard with your hand kind of relaxed and your fingers gently curved. As you listen to the description, try thinking of typing with your hand in the position that she's talking about. So the story continues. I suppose that of course his methods were the best in the world and it never would have occurred to me to mention it might be an unnatural way to play the piano with the fingers bent only at the second joint, and the rest of the hand is held flat, really flat, like you were holding a small book resting on your hand as you play. In this artificial fashion, I learned Schwarwenka's Polish dance. By the time I went home, my right wrist was so badly strained that I could not use it without pain for several months. The surprising thing is that I made any progress at all. For my headaches continued, and it seemed as if I had to lie down 10 minutes for every five minutes of practice. Still, there must have been something tough in my fiber, for I made good progress, and it seemed I could scare, scarcely contain the charge that I felt at the thrill of the music that I was making. The vocal teacher was friendly and kind. My voice was clear and true, but had no strength. The figure who stands out in my memory, sharply etched against the screen of time, is Dr. Tourget. He came from Paris, France, and as we would tell one another, he was a true musician. He was the founder of the New England Conservatory, and he wanted to make it the very best conservatory in America. In the beginning, he was poor, but he had a wealthy friend of whom he begged assistance. One day after their usual talk, the friend told Dr. Tourget, when you make a whistle out of a pigtail, I will get your money for you. Dr. Tourget called his bluff. With fine patience, he finally, he finally fashioned a pigtail whistle, which he took to his friend and he received the money. When I was in school, the whistle rested in a glass case in the lobby of the school. After that year in Boston, I went home again and realized that I was a young lady. In those days, there was a much sharper distinction between girlhood and young womanhood. Standing with reluctant feet where the brook and the river meet. Oh, I had bows. I was marriageable. There was a new kind of laughter and a good time in our house. My sister Bertha was a young lady too. 
Papa still dominated our good time in the sense that we never had as much fun without him as we did when he was home. My mother believed in having a good time at home. Besides giving us a happy growing up, she made useful women of us, by example, more than by teaching. We were never aware when we learned how to sew or bake or manage money affairs, but we knew all right. When I was 19, I married Chester W. Brown, assistant attorney in my father's law office. Chester had a brilliant mind, a good bass voice, and an unpredictable temper. Remember her understated criticism of her piano teacher. Our marriage was extremely unhappy. There were many distressing years when I struggled to keep the children safe and happy. There's no point in a detailed recounting because other lives are always involved in trouble like mine. Although there's scarcely such a thing as a private grief, still some sorrows, once they have spent themselves, should not be given new life in words. I do not even now know what I could have done differently. This is for me again, this is some really sage advice that there are miserable times in life for everyone. We live through it once. So if you continue to talk about it and give our attention to these misfortunes, we are bringing it back to life again and needing to live through it again and again. She knows it's worth seeing how to learn from the experience, but after that, her advice is to let it go. When I was 21, my mother died. She was 41. Now that I know her woman to woman, as one learns to know one's mother after common experiences have evened off the years and revealed the person inside the relationship, I realized that she carried a great deal of responsibility and she carried it sunny side up. Without her, we were completely disoriented, but for our loyalty to our father and, and his to us, we held the family together in the little ways that really mattered. Chester and I lived in my father's home and I ran the house until my father married again. In 1891, my son Harry was born. In 1893, we moved to Jackson, Michigan. Four children were born in Jackson. One of the babies died. In Jackson, I gave music lessons to help with our support. For two years, I went to Ann Arbor one day a week and took music lessons, piano, violin, and harmony paid for by my father. I recall that my harmon harmony teacher told me that I had done three years work in harmony in just three months, but it did not seem hard to me. There is sort of a mathematical relentlessness about harmony. If you get the swing of it, it does itself. In 1902, my father died. His wife and his little girl were left at home in Little Falls, Minnesota. I was then 30 years old and almost a nervous wreck. It was some time later that Chester and I were divorced. I was just about paralyzed with fear. That was when I went to see Dr. Julia M. Walton and I found hope and courage. Several years later, I married Louis K. Harper, an expert paper maker. He was blonde with very blue eyes, heavy set as we used to say. Louis had four daughters, older than my own three sons and one daughter. We had one son, Jimmy. Louis was easygoing and preferred reading Shakespeare to working. He always had periods of wanderlust and would mosey away for weeks on end. On his last trip, he had a stroke from which he finally died. His children were then married, as were three of mine. This marriage and its responsibilities occupied a large part of my days for several years and was, I'm sure, a profitable, part, a profitable part of my spiritual schooling. But the primary story I'm trying to tell here is the story of my gradual understanding of life's dimensions, its reach in time, its freedom in space, its wide association, both sides of the door called death, and the availability of a power of healing, which we do not customarily understand. The children, mine and other people's, have always occupied a good deal of my time and interest, as has been the case with my sister Bertha, who used to have a kindergarten in Chicago. All of my children were musical, 
and when they were small, we had a family orchestra. Henry, four years old, played a half-size violin. Sometimes he play, would play the melody, sometimes alto or tenor in our hymns. Whatever he played, he never made a discord. Little as he was, he would sit with his eyes closed and make up pieces. I wish I had written down some of his melodies. Henry also had a tremendous interest in boat building. When he was six years old, he made a boat with full rigging balanced by tinfoil so that it would float. He never knew where he got his ideas as he never had seen such a boat, nor even a model one of one. Many persons came to marvel and finally a man from St. Paul, Minnesota bought it for $1.50, which was a fortune in those days, especially for a kid. Henry also liked to read, but one time when he was 10 years old, I recall that I had asked him to read a certain book and when he refused, I offered him 50 cents. Later, he told me he had read the whole book word for word, but he could not take the money because he had read the book backwards. Harry, the oldest boy, depended a great deal on his music. At 12, he decided he wanted to play the clarinet in an orchestra, so he went to work practicing four hours a day along with his other duties. He was first clarinet in Rossiter's band when he went to the, when he went to the First World War with them. In many ways, Lillian had the most thoughtful mind of the five, at least the most persistent in ferreting out the reasons for things. Now, Harry is, Harry's daughter Lillian is my grandmother. This is certainly a trait that I share with her. And in another video, I will ask my mother about this. Okay, the youngest son, or what, the third, second son was Eugene was forever working on watches and clocks. Then as he came into his teens, he took to machinery. If there was any distinction in my life, it comes through the achievements of my children. But this is not their story. They are important to this document largely because they furnished the motivation for my work through which my own powers developed. They were my reasons for living and for trying to gain wisdom. Also, they were my joy through the many hardships. I want to alert you that this is where the story begins to shift from your typical biography. If this is to topic is new to you or sounds weird, please just listen and then go do some internet searches on anything that you find odd. There are documentaries covering each of these subjects on YouTube, books, articles that give straightforward accounts of events similar to what Harry recounts here. And also there are the results of researchers attempting to validate or understand. There are likely far more articles from skeptics who are wanting to prove that these ideas are faulty rather than to actually investigate what is going on. These ideas do not fit scientific models. So accepting the possibility that these models show flaws in our current belief systems is unsettling for many people. This comes down to the question of what is logical and what is repeated human experience throughout time, throughout all of history. My interest is in human experience, which is why I enjoy these topics. You have seen that Harry had challenges growing up, but always faced a life in a down to earth, straightforward manner. If it happened, she accepted her experience as a part of her personal growth. She never set out on this path, nor did she gain profit or fame from it beyond the many people that she had helped. What if your great grandmother had things like this in her diaries? What would you think about it? She wrote this down as part of a record that these things happened. I personally have heard stories like what she says from many people. They tell me because I'm curious about it and they can tell that I will listen and not judge their truth or their experience. So I wholeheartedly suggest that you listen, even when it's weird, and then go research beyond just the skeptics to see that maybe, just maybe there could be something more to being human than our current society's belief. These stories go back through history and are recounted and recorded in many sacred books, drawings, cave paintings, and all over the place. Sometimes these stories are revered, other times they are condemned. So is there something, anything here that is worth investigating? 
If what she experienced is true, then what do we do with his information? So let's get back to our story. Then to the fact that all of my children had some psychic ability made my old unfoldment seem more natural. I could mention instances in the childhood of each one of them. But when Jim was a boy, I actually kept a diary and have some definite data, which seems important, to, which seemed important to me to write down. It shows a range of awareness that is often seen in children, yet too often dismissed. I've discovered in children, many young children have a close rapport with persons who have died, but are not lost to companionship. It is also not uncommon that the children have distinct memories of the past experiences on this earth or in some other dimension of experience. I know now that imaginary playmates are not always made up. I turned to my old diaries to share some of these incidents. One day when Jim was six, I left him alone for an hour or so. And when I returned, I asked him if he'd been lonesome. No, the dying doctor was here. Not wanting him to be self-conscious, I asked him casually, oh, can you tell me what a dying doctor is? Well, mother, don't you know that when you die in this world, you're born in another world? Yes, I know that. So far as I knew, he had never heard anything like that talked about, and he had never been with me when I was doing my healing work. But he went right on. There was a little boy here, and his name was Willie, and he was dying. So the doctor came in and he was a nice doctor too. He had a little brown satchel and it was filled with bottles. He took something out of the little bottle and put it in a glass, part full of water and gave it to the little boy to drink. And then he felt better. Then the meadow angel took him. I said, I don't know what a meadow, meadow angel is. Oh, mother, he replied. The meadow angel is the one that helps take care of the little sheeps. I can't see how he could fly when he didn't have any wings. He took the little boy in his arms and he walked right out the window. After a moment, he went on explaining to me, the doctor was a nice doctor. He had a tall hat, square glasses, not like yours. And when he said to me, I like you and you're a nice boy. And then he kissed me goodbye and he said, my name is Dr. Nelson. The next afternoon, I was treating an older woman who was very rheumatic. And in the course of our conversation, she said, I would give anything if I could have the faith that you have. I remarked that when little children can see and hear the truth of, of ongoing life, how could she help but believe? And then I related Jim's experience. She began to cry. She told me that many years ago, she had come from Ireland with a very small amount of money. Finally, when she was out of work with no place to stay, she had walked the street until she was so weary that she sat down on a doorstep and went to sleep. In the morning, the man of the house opened the door to get his newspaper and found her there. He took her into the house and he, his, his wife kept her, adopting her. I still live in that same house. And the man was Dr. Nelson. He always wore a tall silk hat and a yellow duster and square glasses. He was a homeopath and he carried a little satchel with the small bottles. I'm sure he came to Jimmy just so I would believe and take heart. It was when Jimmy was seven that he had an invisible playmate, a little Indian boy whom he called Little Nest. He would often tell me that Little Nest told him such and such a person was coming to see me that day or that the person I was expecting would never come. And I never knew him to be wrong. He would tell me when I was going to get a letter and from whom, and he was always right. I soon took his promptings for granted. Finally, one day when Jimmy was maybe eight, he said to me, I'm not going to tell you anything anymore that I see. I shall not tell you if I see angels or anything. I asked him, why not? We had always spoken freely by ourselves. Because Little Ness tells me that when I go to sleep, you write what I say in a book. And for many years, he never told me another thing that was out of the ordinary. Jimmy's son, Jimmy, later proved to be the grandchild who seemed to have the most insight when small. 
This book has many other stories similar to these. She closes the chapter with, I mention all this because year, the years have brought so much that is strange to many people. And because psychic gifts are looked upon by many people as odd and unnatural, rather than seeing that these experiences as latent capabilities in all of us. I do want to make plain the fact that mine has been a normal life, filled all the while with everyday responsibilities of earning a living and taking care of a family with friends and church associations, with music and trips and picnics and shopping. Understanding comes through ordinary events and duties, not apart from them. <laughs>